Okay, so welcome everybody. Happy Tuesday. My name is Meg. I'm part of the marketing team here at Power to Fly, and I'm going to be your host this afternoon. I am very excited to get started and introduce you to our guests and get started with today's topics. Um, but before we do, we do have a couple quick housekeeping items that we're going to go over. So real quick here, um, we absolutely very much encourage audience participation. So you are more than welcome and highly encouraged to turn on your cameras, come off mute to ask questions or put um, uh, or add comments to today's discussion. Um, the one thing I will tell you is that you will show up on the live recording if you come off mute. So if you don't want to show up on the live recording for whatever privacy reasons you have, that's totally fine, but you can still participate. So to that end, you can put any kind of comments or questions you have into the Zoom group chat. Um, just feel free to type away in there. I'll be monitoring that as we go through today's discussion. And if you have a question that you would like raised for whatever reason you want it to remain anonymous, not a problem. Just instead of sending it to everyone, you're gonna use the drop down menu on the Zoom chat bar um, and select me, Meg Alexander, and you can send it to me instead. I'll make sure your question is raised and I'll make sure that you're kept anonymous. Um, today's session is being recorded. So whether you're able to spend five minutes with us or stay for the whole 60, um, you will get an email with a link to rewatch the recording. It's actually live streaming to our website right now, and that's where the recording will live. Um, and we'll also include any links um, that we might talk about during today's session in that, in that, in that email. So, which is kind of nice because that way you don't have to feel like you have to take, you know, copious notes or, you know, ask a question if you didn't quite hear what somebody said, you can always go back and rewatch it later. And that link is going to be evergreen. It's always free to watch the content. You can share it with whoever you'd like. Um, and we hope that you do so. Uh, last but not least, you are more than welcome to keep up with us on social. We are at Power to Fly on, I think, every social media platform. You can find us there. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find videos like today's, as well as um, a lot more videos from our back catalog and webinars that we host and all kinds of stuff like that. So please feel free to uh, take pictures or video today if you'd like and share them on social uh, so that people know what you've been up to and what you've been learning and what we've been sharing during quarantine. Um, to that end, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Oh, and last but not least, sorry. Um, if you are going to come off mute to ask questions or comment, great. The one thing I will tell you is um, keep yourself on mute unless you're actively talking. I do the same because I've got two bulldogs sleeping under my desk and nobody wants to listen to them snore the whole time. Um, you can take yourself off mute to comment, then put yourself back on. Um, the other thing is feel free to interrupt me if I'm speaking because I get paid to fill the silence. So I, I'm fair season, but try not to interrupt either Lauren or any of our other attendees, just kind of use best practices. Um, so as we get started here, I want to introduce you to our guest speaker today. Lauren Thomas is the general counsel and chief compliance officer for Good Money, which is a digital online banking platform that directs 50% of its pro profits toward environmental and social justice initiatives. When she's not adventuring with her pug through the landscape of Northern California, she's thinking about how businesses and business professionals can help change the world. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks so much. Um, as we get started today, uh, Lauren has a couple notes that we're going to talk about to kind of set a level um, for today's discussion. But before we get into that, I do just want to call out the fact that Good Money is hiring and that you can follow them on Power to Fly. I'm going to put a link into the chat here in just a minute. You can click uh, the follow button at the top of their page. And what that's going to do is it's going to put you on something called their follow network. So that will alert you when they post new roles if they're going to participate in events like today, like our upcoming virtual job fair or our mini summits or webinars or anything like that, it'll let you know. Um, and it's really nice because then it also lets Good Money know that you're interested in working with them. So it kind of works as like, a, you know, your friend on the inside who can recommend and say like, hey, don't forget, like Good Money's hiring now or they just posted a new role or whatever. So, um, and you can follow and unfollow uh, as often as you like. You can do that with as many companies as you like. But if you're interested in today's session, I definitely recommend that you follow Good Money. So, Lauren, to get us started here, um, you have this lovely slide. Um, so what is corporate social responsibility? It's a good question, and I think it's what everyone came here to help answer, right? So let me start by just thanking all of you guys for joining. Um, I see a few Good Money team members on, so 
welcome. But for those of you who don't know and uh, about good money, um, I'm really proud to be the general counsel and chief compliance officer. It's a socially conscious and responsible mobile banking platform um, with all of the activities that you're able to take on our banking platform. We have a partnership with the Rainforest Trust that allows us to help save trees in the Amazon and protect the rights of indigenous people in that area with all of the activities you take on our banking platform. And we have a really cool structure where we give actual equity um, in our company to all of our customers so that you can participate and contribute to our growth the same way all of our employees and everyone else does. And hopefully when we make it big, all of our customers make it big too, because they're all owners similar to in like credit unions of the past. So um, I'm really happy to work at a socially responsible company um, and to talk to you guys about how to identify companies that you may want to support in the space or work at, um, depending on what you're interested in. So we're at a really interesting time in, I think, the history of business where there's been this rise of the conscious consumer, which are basically people who want to make purchase decisions that have positive social, economic, environmental, and political impact. So it's basically, we vote with our dollars for companies that we support, and we're able to boycott companies we don't support by not giving our money to them. Um, and it's kind of reached such a scale where globally, 73% of people say that they would change their consumption habits to reduce impact on the environment. And over 41% of people globally say that they would pay more for uh, products that contain all natural, organic, and socially responsible ingredients, um, which I think speaks a lot to how important environmental and responsibility issues are to consumers. Um, and clearly large companies in particular have been listening. Um, it's really created a watershed moment, I think, for corporations as they realize that customers expect for them to do more than just create products. They expect for them to contribute to society in a positive and socially beneficial way. Um, and as one example, like in 2013, about 20% of S&P 500 companies disclosed their environmental, social, and governance information. Literally two years later, by 2015, 85% of companies started disclosing their ESG information, environmental, social, and governance information, which just shows a huge shift in how corporations are taking social responsibility or at least reporting on it. Um, but for me, the like biggest change was definitely in 2019 when 180 CEOs at the business roundtable said that they were no longer going to focus their company's efforts just on increasing their the value for their shareholders. They made a commitment to lead their companies for the benefits of all stakeholders, including their customers, employees, suppliers and communities. So businesses are responding to this issue for sure, but it also creates the issue I think we're all a little bit worried about, which is greenwashing, um, which means some corporations might be spending more time and energy on trying to advertise how socially responsible they are or how sustainable they are instead of actually making changes to make their business more socially responsible. Um, which gets to this slide, um, which I thought would just anchor our conversation about what it means for a corporation to be socially responsible, because sometimes on the consumption, th consumption side, we think a lot more about the impact that a business has on the environment. But I think more globally, when you're thinking about impact investing and the role that companies play in all of our societies, there are a lot of factors we want to look at besides just impact to the environment, right? Um, so I'm a lawyer and a corporate governance nerd. So for me, I think a lot about corporate governance at companies, which is really like, how is this company structured to make sure that it's mission focused, that ethical responsibility is a high level corporate focus, that there's transparency throughout the company, that the right policies are in place, that there's a code of ethics for how employees are expected to treat each other, that there's information about the supply chain and standards that 
third parties and the business's partners are expected to meet and to make sure there's strong leadership and board oversight over ensuring that the company is making the most responsible decisions. I also think a lot about how a company treats its employees, right? So like you could be doing what you want to do for the environment, but if you're not paying your employees a fair wage, if they don't have benefits and opportunities for growth, if you're not creating job opportunities for people in your community, um, then I wouldn't really count you as a socially responsible company. Um, I think that when it comes to the I also think about things actually in that category, like paid parental leave and 401k matching. I like to look at those things at companies that I'm considering investing in or working at, because even if I'm not planning to have a child soon, like how a company treats parents is something <laughs> that, that matters to me and shows what their values are. Um, obviously when it comes to the environment, you want to think about their impact on the climate, water use, sustainability, and their tracking and transparency of the metrics that they use to consider their environmental impact. Um, when it comes to community, I think a lot of people focus on a company's charitable giving and community involvement for employees. That's important, but when companies are making billions of dollars, spending a few thousand on making charitable donations isn't, it doesn't exactly make them a socially responsible company. So I also think about their supply chain management and their economic impact. Are they partnering with local businesses? Are they offering jobs to people in their community? Um, and people, some people consider diversity and inclusion to kind of fit under that umbrella of community building. But diversity and inclusion is so important for me when I'm thinking about what companies I would want to work for or support that I gave it its own bucket. Um, and I think about like diversity across the board, but I also look at the board of directors, leadership positions, technical and business positions versus just, um, you know, more entry level work because a lot of companies you'll find have gender and ethnic diversity at those levels, but the higher you go up in the leadership chain, you see less of it. Um, and then the last thing I put here is customers. Um, and obviously all companies uh, want to do something beneficial for their customers because that's how they make money. But I like to think about the other things co companies are doing to or for their customers. Like, are they keeping your data secure or are they selling it for as cheap as they can to whatever advertiser they want. Um, working in the financial industry, um, I think about banking services, like what are the interest rates that are being charged? What's in the fine print? Because you can say that you're doing the best thing for the customer, but if in the fine print you have really usurious, terrible interest rates or loan terms, then that also impacts, I think, whether you can or should be seen as a socially responsible company. So as I respond to some of your questions, I'm gonna be thinking about all these different vectors of what it means for a company to be socially responsible um, because depending on what's important to you in the company you're supporting or working for, you're gonna look for different information about whether they're responsible in that area. Um, and hopefully I'll chat a little bit more about that as I answer some of the questions that you've sent through. Thank you so start. much. Thank yeah. you for that. I think it was a really good um, to have like a good set point for everybody as we get started here. Um, so just to flag for everybody, we did um, we did have a lot of questions submitted for this chat. So we tried to organize them into more of a conversational flow, um, condense them to avoid redundant questions, that kind of thing. But to that end, if you are on today's call and you don't hear your question being asked, or even if you're just not sure if your question's gonna be gotten to, please feel free to come off mute and ask your question um, if there's, you know, if you think it might relate to something we're already talking about, or you're more than welcome to put it into the Zoom group chat. I will keep monitoring that um, as well as my direct messages to make sure that we get um, everybody who's present, you, you get answers to your questions because you took the time to join us today. So we wanna make sure that your question gets a response. So to that end, Let's start here with our, one of our first ones. Um, this person had asked, where do you draw the line between corporate responsibility in the community and governance? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And this is one of my favorite questions, I think, because you're the only person who asked about corporate governance. Yay. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, corporate governance is really focused on whether a company is structured in a way that allows it to be responsive to the needs of its customers, employees, community, and the environment. Whereas when I think about responsibility in the community, I'm thinking more about how that company interacts with the community itself. And I'm looking more at factors like corporate philanthropy, volunteerism, and even like ethical marketing in the sense that all of their marketing is fair and transparent and tries to provide customers in the community with information instead of obscuring what they're actually getting to. Um, and when I think about corporate governance and really like, how can you tell if a company has great corporate governance if you're not a lawyer who spends all of your time looking at charters and bylaws? And I think that that is a fair question. The first place I always would start is with the company's mission statement. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more, but I think the a company's mission statement says so much about what its goals are, how it treats the people around it. and what the company is focused on generally. And that'll tell you a lot about how it's structured and what leadership at that company cares about the most. Take a look at a company's investor relations website. Um, that those are, that's where they're advertising to the people who are gonna buy shares of their company. So they provide a lot more metrics and data on those sites about their sustainability impact, their environment, how they're structured, what policies they have in place, because that's kind of where they know the nerds like to go and look. So if you're looking for actual data and not just a company's advertising about sustainability, head to the IR page. While you're there, check out the proxy statement. That's like a company's especially for public companies, it's their advertisement once a year for like why you should vote for their directors and why you should support all of their policies. But it's governed by the Securities and Exchange Commission, which means even though it's kind of an advertising document, everything in there is verified by the SEC and is reported in a very clear way where you can rely on the information. And I especially like to look in proxy statements for stockholder proposals. Um, because sometimes stockholders who are upset get together in large groups and make proposals to the company. Um, and especially recently, a lot of them have to do with the company's environmental, social, and governance oversight. So I like to see what are making stockholders upset and also how the company is responding to it. Are they making changes in response to those stockholders? Are they ignoring their proposals and suggesting you vote against them? Um, and then if you really want to get into it, the IR website will also have like the bylaws and committee charters and all of that. The one thing that I would just look at in particular is whether the company is organized as a benefit corporation or as an Inc or as an LLC. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about B Corps later, but to me, that's the strongest signal that a company is going to be caring a lot more about all of their stakeholders, the community, the environment, than they will on just um, their shareholders. So when I'm thinking about corporate governance, those are the kinds of issues that I'm thinking about. When I'm thinking about the role a company plays in the community, I would just look for like, do they have corporate giving programs or matching programs? Do they have um, other opportunities for their employees themselves to get involved in volunteerism? Does everyone have Earth Day off? Um, and unfortunately, there's no standard reporting on this. So you're going to have to rely on statements from the company about what their relationship is with the community. But I find that where companies are doing a lot to benefit their community, they're going to talk a lot about it and advertise it as much as possible. So. Um, if you see that a company is making a huge effort to talk about how responsible they are in the community, take it with a grain of salt, but also know that the reason they're putting so much emphasis on advertising it is because they put a lot of work into it in the background. So that's how I would think about this one. Thank you for that breakdown. I think that was really, really helpful and touched on a lot of areas that I honestly never would have thought to go into or, or to take a look at. Um, so thank you for that. 
Um, all right. So our next question was a bit more personal. Um, this person said, I'm concerned with the environmental issues that affect our planet as a whole, like ocean pollution, deforestation, and reliance on fossil fuels instead of renewable resources. How can I find tech jobs inside those companies that are really implementing solutions and having real results on these problems? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's really hard actually to know the impact that companies are having on the environment because all of a company's reporting on environmental issues is voluntary. Um, there is no, at this point, unless they are a benefit corporation, obligation for them to share anything with the rest of us about their environmental impact. So for large companies like public companies, instead of just trusting their advertising, I would absolutely look to see if they have a sustainability report or any sustainability reporting. But I would make sure that it's based on a more comprehensive standard and guidelines than just like what the company wants to report. So I think that the global reporting initiative, it's called the GRI, Sustainability Reporting Guidelines, are the most universal, best in class reporting standards on environmental and sustainability issues. So if you're curious about a company's environmental impact, um, look at their reporting, make sure it's either GRI or PRI, Principles for Responsible Investing Standards, so that you know they're using metrics that aren't intended to confuse you. They're like universally standard metrics and reporting requirements. Um, and you can also search the GRI database or CDP database to see which companies report on those metrics. Um, I would also take a look at a few um, like outside ratings agencies on environmental reporting, um, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, the Global 100, MSCI. I'm giving you a lot of acronyms right now. There's gonna be a slide that like has links to these reports that you can pull. And they literally aggregate data from a company's public reporting to measure their environmental impact across a variety of vectors. Um, so look at those. For smaller companies, it's a lot harder to tell because they don't have the resources to put together these like sustainability websites and to do all of the detailed testing on like how many light bulbs their company is using, you know, and the environmental impact of those. So again, I would just really focus on the but what's great about small companies is that if they care about the environment, then they can innovate and create products um, and focus on it in a way that larger companies don't. So for smaller companies, you'll find sustainability, I think, more in their DNA, in their mission statement, like throughout all of their advertising companies like Good Money that partner with Rainforest Trust to, you know, help preserve the environment. We may not be at the size or scale yet where we have like these full scale reporting initiatives. But if you look a little bit into our mission as a company and the kinds of things we're focused on, um, then it will help give you a sense of, you know, what our environmental impact is or will be. Um, but for those small companies, I would really just make sure that it's in their DNA and like it's part of their inherent mission to be socially responsible because if not, it could just be something they're tacking on to try and encourage that uh, conscious consumer to come their way. Awesome. Um, and actually it looks like the person that submitted this question is in the chat and she's saying, um, oh. her name's Roberta. Thanks Roberta. Um, she was saying she was more focused on how to find an IT job in companies that help the environment. That is, oh. if their focus is in, in implementing solutions on pollution and that kind of thing. Are there um, any places people can go to look um, for companies that have that kind of focus? And I apologize. Honestly, if that's a great really question because you. not that I know of, right? So bigger companies now are finally being held to certain standards of environmental responsibility, but that's very different from having like a mission focus and orientation around supporting the environment. So 
In response to another question, I have a set of slides later on mission statements. Um, and maybe we can just jump to that now. Do you mind, Meg, jumping to that no. first slide called mission statements? Not at all. We can go there right now. Also because I keep talking about it, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanna give everyone a second to take a look at some of the mission statements on the page and ask yourself the question of whether the company with that mission statement is a socially responsible company. And maybe I'll just like take a quick poll. So like to build the web's most convenient, secure, cost-effective payment solution is the mission statement of one company. Um, does that company seem socially responsible to you? You can like throw it in the chat. Or what about to be Earth's most customer centric company where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online and endeavors to offer its customers the lowest possible prices. Okay, so lots of no's from the first one. Okay, no's from the second one. Um, to become the number one fashion destination for 20 somethings globally. Should you expect for that company to be socially responsible? Someone said second one sounds okay. Okay, lots of no. I don't know, that the number um, three sounds like it could be a little bit more, more, just if they're focused on 20 somethings, which who is a group that tends to be a little bit more socially conscious. That's totally fair, right? The fact that they're trying to appeal to 20 somethings may say something about them and what 20 somethings care about. Yeah, and um, Amy's actually calling out in the chat that lowest price is not always the best for people or the environment. So that's a very good point. Right, and I would encourage you to think again about what it means to be socially responsible, right? Like, does it mean helping the environment? Does it mean getting customers low prices? Because that is helpful for some people, right? Like, that is a social good in a lot of ways to offer low prices. Um, what about the fourth one, to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors? Yeah, I mean, that one's pretty on its face. Um, what about our deepest purpose as an organization is helping support the health, well-being, and healing of both people, customers, team members, and business organizations in general, and the planet? lots of yeses for number four and for number five rather and number six is to improve every life through innovative giving and education community in the environment would you say that that is a socially responsible company mostly yeses do you mind hitting the next slide Okay, so there was one trick in here, which is that there's a nonprofit, the American Red Cross. Um, otherwise, I you could see Whole Foods, right? Their mission, even though they're these are all e-commerce companies. I should have mentioned um, either e-commerce or commerce companies. Obviously, Whole Foods was a benefit corporation, very ethically focused. You can see that in their mission statement. I was really surprised by 3M's mission statement because I think of them as making like tape and home products for painting. And like, I was surprised when I saw that their mission statement was so like sustainability and responsibility focused. But I looked at some of the aggregators of information about socially responsible companies and 3M comes through on so many vectors of like paying their employees best in class wages and like matching all of their employees donations to organizations. So maybe you wouldn't think of them as being the most ethical company in the world, but it, just by looking at their mission statement, you immediately start to think that they may have other priorities besides just making products for painting, right? Um, Amazon, everyone said no, but I thought that was really interesting because being really good to your customers is one vector of being socially responsible, right? It doesn't say anything about whether they care about the environment or whether they care about um, certain communities that they serve or whether they even care about their employees, but they're very clear as a company that they care about their customers, right? That is their mission. And if you've shopped at Amazon, you know that you get 
very low prices, very fast shipping and great customer support. So they may not care about other vectors of social responsibility that matter to you, but clearly as a company, they're very committed to this one vector. So I like to play this game with mission statements because I think it'll surprise you sometimes looking at certain companies it'll really give you a sense of what leadership and management thinks about as that company's priorities, even if it's not obvious to you just from the type of business that they do. So um, when I say that there's no necessarily standard for environmental reporting, I would start with mission statements um, because it applies to companies big and small. They all have them, they all put them on their website. And if the word sustainability or focus on the planet or the environment comes up, regardless of what kind of company it is, I would dig in a little bit more and feel a little bit more confident that the leadership at that company is going to care about what they put in their mission statement. So. That was awesome. Thank you for calling that yeah. out. That was, really, <laughs> that was a really good way to illustrate that point. Um, yeah, thank you for that. All right, so, okay, so one of the other questions that we yeah. had actually coming up next, I'm gonna go back to it here. Yeah. Um, and I, feel free to tell me if we've kind of covered this already. This person says, I have a tight budget with little room for any excessive spending. How can I be confident that my money is not only doing what I need it to do for me, but also helping others? So we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of the mission statement of the company and how to look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you feel we should add, especially, you know, when it comes to that, conscious consumerism? Yeah, so I think there are maybe two parts of this question because it's a little bit more focused on what to do. Conscious consumption is the, the one part that I think we're like getting on the path to answering how to find those sustainable companies. But the other part seemed like, what can you do in terms of banking and investing as well? Um, and when it comes to those spaces, I would look for organizations, again, that are signifiers that the bank is trying to do something good. So the Global Alliance on Banking Values, the GABV, is kind of the biggest banking watchdog group to make sure, like, membership is voluntary, but it shows a commitment to certain values in banking, transparency, like, um, respect for your community and the environment. And look for CDFI, Community Development Financial Institutions as, as well. Um, those are banking institutions that have shown like a higher commitment to providing good services for their customers. Um, and otherwise for like making those investment decisions, I would again go to the IRR website, proxy statements, the corporate governance indices that I mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, I hope that that answers that question. And if you're talking about ESG investing, because if you're on the line, let me know what you're trying to focus on. But if, if that's it, then recently there are a lot of opportunities to invest in socially responsible funds as well. Like I have some funds at Fidelity, for instance, where I invest in women owned businesses and businesses that have a positive impact on the environment. And when you're investing, I also encourage you to look for funds that explicitly exclude investments in oil extraction and for me private prisons and if there's anything on your list of where you don't want for your money to go look for funds that are explicitly excluding those categories of investments and let's stop putting our money and our investments into companies that are you know manufacturing guns or exploiting the environment because we don't have to and like finally those options for ESG investing exist so. Very nice. Thank you for calling that out. Um, okay, so this next question is a little bit more uh, kind of personal to you. Um, yeah. This person wants to know, how did you become interested in social corporate responsibility? It's kind of a long winding question. So um, I will start at the beginning um, of time. Now, when 
I graduated from college. I'd been accepted to my dream law school already. I wanted to go to Yale. I got in. Um, and then I deferred because I wanted to pursue what I thought was my real dream of working in the performing arts. Um, so I went to become the special events assistant at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which was the most incredible job. I love the arts and performing arts organizations, but I think my parents were in a place of, we just paid for you to go to Harvard and now you're earning minimum wage and living at home. So like, maybe you should reconsider going to law school. Um, and I was like, great, I'm gonna go back to law school and I'm gonna come back to the performing arts, but I'm gonna be the general counsel and chief operating officer for Lincoln Center or the Smithsonian and having this legal education is gonna help me get there. So I went to law school thinking that I really wanted to focus on intellectual property, performing arts, nonprofit law, um, which is how I got introduced to a lot of the background knowledge about B corporations and different ways that nonprofit and socially responsible companies are organized and thinking about that from a legal perspective. But digging in on IP and law school also made me realize that all of the interesting questions for me were the tech questions. <laughs> like all of the nonprofit law questions are kind of old and had already been answered. And all of the tech questions were new and interesting and in unsettled areas of law. So I came out on the other end wanting to work in technology just because I'm an intellectually curious person, but that background of wanting to be in the nonprofit space and thinking through structures of organization so that they can provide public benefit has always been in the back of my mind. I think that it really came to a head for me when I was working at Square, um, which is a payments company um, also in San Francisco. I'd spent a bunch of years doing mergers and acquisitions and corporate governance. And I worked on Square's IPO as outside counsel and then they needed someone to come in house and like, perfect, they already knew me and I'd already worked with them and I moved to California for this job. Um, and my job was really doing corporate governance and mergers and acquisitions for Square. But part of that was thinking about what should our board of directors be overseeing? What is their job? How, how can they do a better job at making sure Square is a well-run company? Um, and I personally in that position thought they could be doing a much better job of overseeing Square's environmental, social, and governance aspects. So. I think someone asked this question later, but my approach was kind of to back end into it by saying like, oh, we need to update our corporate charters so that our board of directors has direct oversight over ESG issues. And then once we bake that in, I was like, oh, well now that there's oversight, we need to actually do something about it and have a committee and like make some plans on what we're going to report to them. And that's when I was really able to dive into coordinating a bunch of teams at Square to start doing our ESG reporting and oversight. And it kind of naturally led to my role at Good Money because it just became so important to me. And so much of my time and energy was thinking about like, how can corporations inherently built in have the structures that will make them more responsive to all of the stakeholders in their communities. So long story, but that's how I ended up here. And I, I think that this is where I'm gonna stay. That's honestly amazing. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, I'm kind of still stuck on the fact that graduating Harvard wasn't enough to buy you a couple months on your parents' couch. Like, that doesn't do <laughs> it. Was, it. God, it was two what years was going to. It was like two years on their couch. So I think, right. I think they were ready for. Okay, fine. Fair. <laughs> But yeah, like that, that honestly makes a lot of sense. You know, if you have that interest in kind of the uncharted territory, tech is where that area is within the law. Yeah. Um, I have a paralegal background and went to a year of law school. So I'm right there with you in saying like, there are definitely areas of law that are pretty settled, pretty well trod. There's not a lot of growth or new things happening in them. Um, so yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, you want, you want the uncharted territory. You also want the, the social uh, you know, responsibility aspect. It makes sense. Yeah, I've always wanted to like do well for myself and do good for others. Um, 
without actually putting one in front of the other. Um, and to find that balance in my life, including everywhere I work, I think that's kind of why we're all on this call because we want good jobs that pay the bills, but we also want to feel good going to bed at night that like we're making the world a better place than we left it. And just trying to find the nexus of doing that in the corporate world um, is, is a challenge. Um, so trying to find socially responsible companies. And if you can't find it, build those structures into the companies that you're already working for will just, I mean, not only help make your company better, but make the world better. Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of backpack off of that, um, we do have uh, one question that's in between, but I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna skip that one for a second. Um, this person had asked, what are some realistic ways I can raise my concerns and values to leadership so that they will be well received? Um, you kind of started to touch on this in your last answer, um, but do you have anything else that we can expand on for this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my, my approach to building out Square's um, corporate social responsibility program was really to play to the self-interest of the people in leadership who would be making those decisions. So I started out by finding a bunch of reporting like, the Bloomberg ESG reports and the Dow Sustainability Index. And I saw that we had really low scores across the board, including in areas where we actually had really good programs. We just didn't advertise them anywhere. So all of the people who were looking for ESG investing opportunities didn't realize that Square like has a 401k matching program and great benefits for employees because it's just not anywhere on our website. So when I went to leadership, I really build that as like, this is an opportunity for us to share the amazing things that we're already doing. And there are a couple of other things that we could be doing as well to like really build out this amazing, you know, picture to tell our investors. Um, and that was another thing is getting buy-in from other teams. So the investor relations team felt like they didn't have enough information to share with investors about Square's ESG approach. The product team, our hardware manufacturing team, didn't feel like they had the institutional support to build out like a vendor um, supply chain standards. So getting buy-in from lots of different teams was essential and then posing it to leadership in a way where it was like, um, this will make us as a company more successful, be able to recruit the kind of candidates and talent that we want, be able to have a positive story for our investors. So this is worth your investing in. Quite frankly, those weren't all of the reasons why building out an ESG program was important to me, but those things were really important to the people who were able to make the decisions and funnel the resources in the right way. Um, so, and quite frankly, that company was already very ethically minded, even if we didn't have like a structured program for it, right? Like Square's mission was economic empowerment. So we may not like always go back to the mission, right? To see what kind of company you're dealing with. It doesn't say our mission is like to help the environment, but the mission is still an idea of helping people like grow, being good corporate citizens, um, and appealing to that mission and appealing to leadership in that way was, was my approach. So just think about, it's not to say that the ends justify the means, but playing into the self-interest of the people who can make those decisions is one effective way to be able to get that programming across. And the other thing I would say is like, make like Nike and just do it. So like, don't wait for someone to tell you that there should be you don't have to tell leadership that you need a code of ethics and conduct at your company or that you need better supply chain standards, build it, share it, get their sign off on it, and then go implement it. Um, so like come with the plan already. It's so much easier for someone to just sign off on something that's already done than to like take up the mental space of having to do it themselves um, or figuring out how to get it done. So 
even if it feels like extra work when it comes to making your company more socially responsible, it's totally worth it to do outside of work or when you have free time and then just come with the whole plan ready to go so that leadership can just sign off and let you run on it, run with it instead of putting something on their plate that they'll have to figure out how to do. I think that's a really good call out too. If you're, if you're meeting them where they are and you're making it clear that like, okay, I see that you value these things. Here's how this action will help you achieve those goals and also these other fringe benefits. Yes. Then yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. And I love the <laughs> idea of like kind of making your own opportunities of saying, you know, doing the extra legwork to be like, here's what we could do. And I already have a plan in place of how we can implement it. So why don't we try it and see how it works? That's exactly it. Make it easy for them, right? Like make it so that they have very few excuses to say no. Yeah. It's a sales basic. Make it easy to say yes and hard to say no. Exactly. I love it. All right. So we touched on, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but how effective do you think certified B corporations are in holding companies accountable for social and environmental responsibility? Oh my gosh, I love B Corps. Let's talk about it. So I think the first thing is, what is a B Corp? And often when I hear people talking about B Corps, they're confusing two different ideas, which overlap. The first is a benefit corporation is a type of legal entity like an Inc or an LLC or a PC. It's literally the type of structure that you go to the state and say, I'm creating a business, it's going to be this kind of business. And it differs from regular corporations in the sense that a corporation is owned by its shareholders and the obligation of the corporation is to increase value for the shareholders. And there's very little wiggle room for corporations to have obligations to other constituencies that aren't their shareholders. So even like any corporation that wants to do something good for the environment, they can't just say, is this good for the environment? They have to say, is helping the environment good for our share price to help our shareholders? Um, which doesn't create a lot of wiggle room even for companies and executives that really do want to do socially good things. If it hurts their stock price, then their stockholders can and will and should sue. A benefit corporation explicitly says that the company will be responsible for its shareholders, um, employees, community, the environment, and any other stakeholders that the company wants to identify. It allows that company to set its own mission that must have a public benefit to society. Um, and there's a ton more transparency and accountability with B corporations because they're legally required to share certain information about their sustainability and social and environmental performance. And other constituencies can sue the corporation for failing to live up to its public benefit, which is so cool <laughs> because it allows like a private right of action if a company that says it's gonna do the right thing for the environment actually isn't doing it. So that's the corporate structure itself. But what I think when a lot of people think of B Corps, they're thinking about B Corp certification. And that is a process where a nonprofit called B Lab is certifying that a company meets certain standards of social and environmental performance, accountability and transparency. And they use this assessment tool to ask all kinds of questions about a corporation. And at first I was like, oh, you only have to score 80 out of 200 possible points. Um, but as I have gone through the B-Lab assessment quite a few times now, it is really hard to even get to those 80 points. Um, so it's a very high standard for corporations that are doing the right thing from a government, governance, employment, community, and especially environmental standpoint. Being B Corp certified, if you get the certification, then within two years, you have to also become a benefit corporation, which means changing your corporate structure. However, you can be a benefit corporation and still not meet the lab certification standards. So I just want to make sure that we're differentiating between those two things because certified B Corps that are certified by B Lab, if you see that standard on like a company website, 
it's an incredibly high and very difficult standard to meet. Um, I will say now that I'm at a small private company that's trying to do the right thing, it some of those standards are just like too expensive for us to meet. Like, oh, we would love to have a tuition reimbursement program, but like we're a 50 person company and growing and we're gonna get there one day to like the 401k match and the six months of parental leave and like really aspire to hit the gold standard uh, like across the board, but it's expensive and hard for companies to do that. So if a company does have that certification, I would say that they are being held to a particularly high standard for social and environmental responsibility. And B Lab, I think, is one of the best certifiers of that standard in the market today. So, um, and it's mostly based on a company's self assessment, but I think they submit 10% of their companies to an audit every year. So they're actually auditing each of these companies to make sure at some point in their life cycle to make sure that they're actually committing to those standards. So I would trust it. So Chloe had asked in the chat, um, who sets the B Corp standards? And is there any way we as public can contribute to what those standards are? So B Lab, you cannot contribute to what those standards are, although you can of course see those standards. And if you go and you can see, so if a company says they're B Lab certified, not only can you look up to make sure that they're B Lab certified, you can see how they scored on the various assessments. So like, did they get 82 points or did they get 180 out of the 200? And you can see that on their site, um, but there's no feedback mechanism from the public. Um, and then for benefit corporations, again, it's a state mandated legal structure. So you can comment on it the same way that you can comment on any legislation that your state seeks to pass. Um, but there's no avenue for public contribution to those standards, unfortunately. And Chloe, if it were up to me, actually, there would be federal government standards. There would be, we, we can talk about Elizabeth Warren later. Um, she has a lot of really interesting ideas about how to create like universal, like, and the SEC and just like 10Ks and Qs and proxy statements are a great example of the government actually forcing companies to make public representations that we can all trust are accurate. And we need that kind of cross the board, forced reporting, standardized reporting, in my opinion, from the government level down so that we can trust what companies are telling us about their ESG activities um, in a way that is standard and not like to the whims of that company's PR department and how they want to describe it. But so it doesn't exist yet, but I hope it will, Chloe. Okay. Um, Thanks, all right. Lauren. So, thank you so much for asking that question, Chloe. Um, as we go through here, I see we got one more question that was in the chat. Um, this person, Jeremy, had asked, Lauren, what is your take on companies dedicating a board seat to an employee, and what about doing this at early stage startups? Yeah. So <laughs> in Europe, that's actually required. Um, that there be a labor representative to the board. It's also required in Japan. Some layer of that is required in Canada. It may not be an explicit board seat, but there's labor representation in board meetings. They have observer rights where they can sit in on meetings, see everything that the board of directors is getting. Um, not only am I supportive of those kinds of structures. I mean, I think Silicon Valley is very different at technology companies because equity is such an important part of your compensation package that technology companies are some of the only companies where employees are genuinely owners. They can get together as a public company and vote. And like you'll see at some of these larger companies like Google's, Google employees are really organizing around how many shares they have and being like, we're going to put this shareholder proposal on the ballot. Um, and we're going to hold our company responsible because we own 3% of this company, just collectively us angry people. Um, and at the end of the day, that's the best accountability. Um, 
But for every other company where employees don't have that kind of direct ownership and representation at their company, I'm extremely supportive of having labor, at least oversight of board activities and not just labor, but community oversight as well. Um, a lot of banks have a structure where there's expected community oversight of like how the bank is running. And there are committees that allow for members of the community to have information about like technically private information about how the company is running behind the scenes. And I love both of those structures so much. Part of what attracted me to good money is the idea that we're making all of our customers owners, like that tangible ownership and oversight over how companies function isn't just in the best interest of those communities. I really hope it's the future and that like Europe is setting a standard for how US corporations will, will also be run in the future. But if the coronavirus response hasn't made you guess, I think culturally we have very different perspectives on the role that employees play at their companies and the value that they bring. So I really think it's gonna be a cultural shift in the US to realize that employees aren't expendable or interchangeable, that they should be owners and have oversight over the companies they work for. And they're just as important as the stockholders or the customers or anyone else to whether that company is successful. So long-winded answer that I'm very supportive. But it's very helpful. So thank you for <laughs> going the distance and, and really fully explaining that to us. I think it's very much appreciated. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left. I do want to try and get to one last question that's going to touch on your last slide. So for this question, this person is a little bit long-winded, but I'm going to kind of summarize to, to ask, from your perspective, what is the most ethical company that you've seen, knowing that even the ones that are more, more ethically you know, forward about what they are doing also have some you know, skeletons in their closet or some things that they're maybe not doing as well as they could be? Yeah, I would just go back to like, there are so many vectors of what it means to be socially responsible. But if you look at a company like Tesla, right? From an environmental perspective, like they're amazing. They've like restarted the entire electric car industry and made them sexy. And the impact that can have on emissions is great. From a corporate governance perspective, they're terrible. And like, <laughs> like they have bad oversight and uh, their CEO doesn't, at least from what I can see, make decisions with the best interests of this community and his employees in mind. So from a sustainability perspective, right? Amazing company, but depending on if diversity and inclusion and good governance and oversight are important to you, then you'd see them as a less responsible company. Um, and I think that's just true across the board for most companies, even the ones that are trying to do the right thing, that they'll be nailing it in certain vectors and just not living up to what might be our standards in others. So the best thing I can do is just encourage you to make, to think about what are the most important factors for you in the companies that you support or work for, and then index to those things. And once you get there, do everything you can to help make your company responsible in all of the ways they may not already be. Um, yeah, so these are just some of the sources that I've mentioned um, for where you can find information on whether a company is responsible, um, including some of the like rankings and ratings, certifications that I look for. And we didn't talk about those conscious consumption websites. So I separated ESG just because you might want like data, like how much, who is the worst emitter um, or you might want recommendations on like where to shop for sustainable clothing and good on you and done good are great for that. And the human rights campaign has great information about whether companies are responsible on the employee and customer side and really like the, from a human rights perspective, um, rather than just the sustainability perspective. So. We are more than happy to, um, to share these links with, uh, within the rewatch link that we're gonna, or rewatch email that we send out to everybody that registered for today. 
All right. Um, so it looks like we've come to the end of our time today. I'm sorry. I know it always goes too quickly. We were not able to get to all of the amazing questions that you all asked, but thank you so much um, for submitting them. I have put links into the chat so you can, um, again, follow Good Money um, and also connect with, uh, with Lauren if you'd like to follow up on maybe some of the questions that were asked today. Um, before we leave, I do just want to call out the fact that Good Money is hiring. So if you follow that link that I put into the chat box, um, you can check out their open roles. I highly recommend that you apply via Power to Fly. It makes sure that um, there will be somebody else um, on our end of, the, of, uh, of things kind of following up on your application to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. Um, but Lauren, could you speak to, um, honestly pick a question here, what, what your favorite part is about working for them, any tips about somebody who's looking to be hired, anything along these lines? Um, um. Yeah, so for the positions, please go to the careers section of our website. It is up to date. And I think there are like seven or eight positions we're hiring for. So lots are open. And my tip, if you're interested in applying, is to do so. Um, all of our submissions are read by an actual human being. Um, we obviously, diversity and inclusion is incredibly important to us. So I definitely want to encourage um like anyone who thinks they might be interested or that a role may apply for them just to put their resume in. Um, my favorite part about working for Good Money is that if you haven't guessed, I have a lot of pretty audacious ideas for how companies can be more responsible. And I love working at a company where I can at least try to put them into action um, and know that they are well received and that everyone who I work with has the same goals of doing the best thing for our community as well. Um, and to be on that kind of mission aligned team makes me excited to come into work every day. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing and for joining us and taking time out of your day to, to really share your expertise and help break down some of these, um, these really kind of large ideas for the rest of us. Um, I want to say a big thank you to everybody who submitted questions um, both before and during today's seminar. It was it's amazing and we really would not be able to hold these events without your questions. So thank you so much to everybody that participated. Um, Lauren, is there anything that you'd like to say before we sign off for today? No, LinkedIn, if you have any questions, I could talk about this stuff all day. So please let me know. Um, and also just like Outside of sustainability, the other thing I really care a lot about, especially is like empowering women in the workplace. So if you have any general questions about how to advocate for yourself, I also love answering those kinds of questions and giving advice. So let me know. Excellent. Um, so I put Lauren's LinkedIn information in there so you can connect with her. Um, please feel free to check out um, some of the other links. I'm also gonna drop a link right now so that you can go ahead and check out some of our upcoming uh, events that we're gonna have in the next week. Um, don't forget, we also have a virtual career fair coming up in conjunction with our mini summit that's happening on September 11th, 10th and 11th. Um, so we look forward to hopefully seeing you all there. Um, please take a look at the website and hopefully we'll see you around on some more chats uh, starting tomorrow morning. So thanks for coming everybody. Have a happy Tuesday. <laughs>